Did James Webb break the age of the universe? Can we watch asteroids that are about to hit the moon? How much actual astronomy is done on the International Space Station? Plus, in our extended version on Patreon, what shape do black holes take? Answering all these questions and more in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are across my channel. The question pops in your brain. Just write it down, gather them up, and I'll answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Luke Profanic. What is the deal with James Webb possibly showing us that the universe is older than 13.8 billion years? Can it be older? This story that James Webb has potentially shown that the universe is older than the age of the universe as defined by or measured in other ways is one cosmologist's theory. So when James Webb made its early observations, it found galaxies that appeared to be very large and very mature for their age, that even within the first few hundred millions of years, Webb seemed to be seeing galaxies that were fully formed. And so one theory that people had was that, in fact, the universe is a lot older than we thought, and that this is a way to maybe overturn the other measurements that astronomers have made about the age of the universe, like say in the cosmic microwave background radiation. Now the background radiation is like the gold standard for measuring the age of the universe. And so you need a lot of evidence and a good theory to explain how the cosmic microwave background radiation could be wrong. But those first initial observations from James Webb were rough, that they took some first observations, they saw some galaxies, they measured their redshift, they looked at their sizes and said, wow, those are really big, those are really old, that's really weird. And then follow on observations have come along. And you know, now we're a couple of years into this and people have had have been able to kind of go round two and spend more time and take more data. And they found that no, in fact, these galaxies aren't unusually large, unusually well developed. They are the kinds of galaxies that you could expect with the current theories of the universe, the lambda cold dark matter model. And so that you probably haven't heard much about this going on in astronomy news for the last couple of months, because this controversy has mostly been settled. And what do you know, the kind of things have fallen back in line as better data is getting gathered. But still, the universe is looking like it did come together that the galaxies came together a, a lot more quickly than people were expecting and that like, that the mass of the black holes, the supermassive black holes at the hearts of these galaxies compared to the, you know, the galaxies around them is very different from the ratio than what we see today. Like today, the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way is less than 1% of the mass of the galaxy. It's a fraction of the mass, but you're seeing galaxies with supermassive black holes that are like 10% more. And so these ratios are really strange. And so maybe it's sort of changing our understanding of how these galaxies come together and how what role like does did the supermassive black hole just come together first? Did it collapse directly and then the rest of the galaxy formed around it? Now there is this other sort of theory that rolled around where someone was predicting that well, maybe actually the universe is double the edge. And that the way you could explain how the universe looks older than it is, is if the universe is actually a lot bigger and older than we thought and the way but they had to invoke a, a, a very controversial theory about redshift. And that is this idea of tired light that that over long periods of time, that instead of like just redshifting, that photons actually lose energy as they pass through space, and that adds additional redshift to them. And then that would explain why you're seeing actually the universe is a lot bigger than we think. So right now, because astronomers, you know, astronomers saw something weird, they got more time on the telescope, they realized the thing wasn't as weird as they thought, and mystery mostly solved. Striatic. Is there much astronomy conducted on the International Space Station? Sort of. So the problem with the International Space Station is that as it is going around the Earth, it has gyros that are keeping it pointing down at the Earth. And so it rotates every 90 minutes as it goes once around the Earth, and it's constantly turning, turning, well, for us, the stars shift 
over 24 hours. But if you're on the International Space Station, the stars shift every 90 minutes. And so Don Pettit, who's an astronaut currently on board the International Space Station, he has done several tours on the station and on the space shuttle. And he's been really frustrated at how difficult it is to do to take pictures of space while you're on the space station. And so in fact, he custom built a mount for his camera that turns in the opposite direction of the space station. And so he brought it up as his own personal, like, possessions for his trip to the space station, and then he installed it. And so now he's able to take long exposure pictures of stars and galaxies and that kind of thing from the the window outside of the of the space station, which is which is just awesome. Like Don Pettit is is such a nerd, um, but but in the, the best possible way. But there are instruments on board the International Space Station that do astronomy, and they actually have like racks outside the station where they change them up with different kinds of experiments. But one, just to give you an example, it's called the Neutron Star Interior Composition Explorer, or NICER. And it's an X-ray telescope that is on the outside of the International Space Station. And so its job is to detect X-rays coming from neutron stars and help map out their position across the universe. And so you know, x-rays, like detecting x-rays is a little different than, than a telescope that has to remain on target. And so in this case, they're able to detect these coming from, from all directions. So just in general, the space station is not a very good platform for astronomy. It kind of shakes, it has to turn all the time. And so it's much better to have a free floating, completely separate space station. And it's funny because the Chinese, when they built their space station, their original plan was that they were going to attach the Chinese version of the Hubble Space Telescope to the station. And they realized that that was actually probably not the best idea. And so it's going to be launching soon. And when it does, it's going to fly in formation with the space station. And so the astronauts will be able to bring it close to the station, they'll be able to work on it, repair it, upgrade it, update it, and so on, and then put it back into its position, maintaining, you know, flying in formation with the station, which I think is a pretty elegant idea. If you enjoy The Question Show, remember that the full episode is two hours long, and we cut out about 40 minutes of that that makes the two question shows that we release every week, and then the rest becomes something that we call overtime. And we post the overtime, it, actually it's video, with even additional B-roll over on Patreon. And so if you become a member on Patreon, you'll get access to all of that additional content. Check it out, patreon.com slash universe today. Thanks to everyone who has already subscribed and welcome to our recent newcomers. Russell Beer, Jamie, John Hill, Joel Champ, Jeff Kilborn, and Space Before. Join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. DJ Alexander, what preparations should I make for Halley's Comet? I've always been hearing about it since I was in single digits. Where should I go to view it the best? So Halley's Comet last came by the Earth in 1986. And I was there for that. I was 15 years old. And so I remember seeing Halley's Comet. It wasn't a great flyby of Halley's Comet. We've seen better. But this was an opportunity that scientists took. They were able to send a mission that did a flyby of the comet from the European Space Agency. And then it won't come back until 2061. So I'm going to look at my watch now. And of course, that's worthless, but it's a way for me to try and wrap my mind around what year we're in. It's 2025. So you're looking at another 30 plus years before Halley's Comet comes. So like what preparation should you do? I don't know. Detach yourself from the Matrix briefly to, to watch Halley's Comet in the sky. You know, you should be ready at all times to appreciate all comets. Halley's Comet will, will be fine, but there are better comets that come a lot more often than that. Halley's Comet was, you know, was, was fine, but uh, Hakutake and Hale Bop were amazing. And so we got two comets that came back in like 99, 2000 that were dramatically better than Halley's Comet. So don't worry about Halley's Comet. Uh, if it shows up, it shows up. If it's good, it's good, great. There should be better comets between now and then. And, you know, we did have a, a recent comet that was okay, and was visible from the southern hemisphere. Um, like, does that really count? 
If it's only visible from one hemisphere, it's not fair. So we need a comet that's like big, bright, long tail, visible from everywhere on Earth. Uh, and we haven't had one really since Hillbop and Hakutake, which are 20 now, like five plus years ago. James Huffman, how do we know the mass of a black hole if no information is accessible? Well, you don't need to have access to the information inside a black hole to know the mass of a black hole. All you need to know is how things orbit around the black hole. And that tells you what the mass is. And this is a relatively straightforward calculation. You should, you, you can learn this in high school of uh, physics, where if you know the orbit of the object that is going around the black hole or the earth, or whatever, then you can use that to calculate the mass of the object. And so you can, and there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. I mean, as long as there's something orbiting around a thing that will tell you the mass very accurately. And, and Newton came up with these calculations uh, hundreds of years ago. George Kalis, would you prefer light traveling immediately so you can see large distances away in real time or light traveling as it does so you can see back in time? I way prefer that we can see back in time, that if light didn't take time to get to us, then we would see the entire universe as it is today, which would be obviously like a little bit interesting, you know, we could see these galaxies that are very far away, and they would be completely mature, and we would see them as they as they look right now. But we wouldn't get any sense of the history, we wouldn't have any understanding of how the universe unfolded, we wouldn't see the cosmic microwave background radiation, everything would look modern. And so no, I think the fact that light takes time means that the farther we see, the further back in time we're looking, and we get these hints about what the early universe uh, was like, and we know our history. And so without this, we wouldn't be able to know the history of the universe. Known unknown. Do we track meteors that might hit the moon? We don't track meteors that might hit the moon. I mean, uh, with this new asteroid, uh, WR4, 2024 WR4, um, there is a 1% chance that it's going to hit the moon in 2032, which is pretty exciting. That would be kind of amazing if a 60 meter asteroid, 50 meter asteroid crashed into the moon, we would see it. It would be obvious. Um, but smaller objects crash into the moon all the time and create these little flares. And for the longest time, this was a bit of a myth. So people were reporting that, you know, they were looking through the telescope, they were looking at the moon, and they were saying, I just saw something flash. I think something just crashed into the moon. But the scientific community was skeptical. And so then people set up cameras that watched the moon continuously. And these are the transient lunar events. And so they were watching the moon continuously, and they started to detect a large number of these objects crashing into the moon and creating this flash. And I actually experienced one. So there was a lunar eclipse a couple of years ago, and I was live streaming the lunar eclipse with a friend of mine. And the reports came out that during the lunar eclipse, something smashed into the moon and caused a flash. And so we went back through our coverage. And there it was, there was this moment where there was this tiny little flash on the screen at exactly the right time. And so we and everybody else who was filming the the moon at the time saw this flash. And so we know that rocks of various sizes are pelting into the moon. And when they do, they're like little bombs going off and we can see the flashes from Earth. Now we've got a longer version of this show with one additional question. It's over on Patreon. And you can go and see a link in the show notes or in the comments. Go over there, you can watch the exact same episode, but now it's got one additional question. There's no ads, it's completely free, you don't have to sign up, check it out. All right, those are all the questions that we had this week. Thank you everyone who asked questions in the YouTube comments, everybody who showed up for the live stream. Now remember this thing is two hours long, we record every Monday at 5pm somewhere in the world, there's a link to the next event somewhere here on this channel. So check that out. Now I'm going to give you another thing that's on my shelf. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Barry Lee Griffin, David Gilhead, David Matz, Dustin Cable, Greg Feely, Hudson Moore, James Clark, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Michael Purcell, Paul Robach, Sean Sargent, Spidersoft.io, Stephen Father Melny, Thomas L. Skadron, and Vlad Shiplin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. All right, this What's on My Shelf is very special, and these are props from The Expanse. 
television show, which is like one of my favorite sci-fi television shows. And so someone reached out to me and said, hey, Fraser, I'm one of the prop designers on The Expanse, and I know you like the show, and would you like some official props from the show? And I said, yes, please. So this is Proto Molecule. And so if you remember the Proto Molecule, the kind of blue icy thing that's on things, this is what it is. And it's, it's, it's pretty cool. It's plastic. They, they sort of made a mold and then made a bunch of them, made them out of this, this clear plastic. And then the other thing that I have is a slug from the part where they were on the alien planet and there are little slugs going around. And so I've got one of the little slugs and it's I don't know, made of silicon, I think, with a little sort of vein in the middle. Anyway, I think this is like one of my favorite things that's on the shelf. Uh, it's so cool and it's such a great connection to the show. All right, we'll see you next week.